Welcome to Circle YXE Online. My name is Austin and we are excited to have you with us this morning. In a few moments, we're going to hear a couple of songs and Brent Trickett will continue in our series, Not As Advertised. If this is your first time tuning in, we wanna welcome you here. We would love to connect with you and say hi. If you're watching this live, just click the connect button in the chat or send us a message on Facebook or send us a short email to connections at cdac.ca. We would love to help you get connected. We are so glad that we have the technology to stay connected in a time like this, but it is your continued support and generosity that allows us to do any of it. We can't thank you enough. If you aren't sure how to support the work of Circle in our city and beyond, or haven't yet, we would love to help you do that. Just follow this link to learn how. We are now going to take the next 30 seconds to practice generosity by giving. In fact, I'm gonna do it right now on my phone. All right, all done. We are now going to send it to David and Darcy. Enjoy. shadows step out of the grave break into the wild and don't be afraid run into wide open spaces graces waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted graces Waiting where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of his love. For the spirit is here, let there be Spaces, graces, waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Graces, waiting. Will the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. There is freedom. Will the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the dark. Just as you are into the fullness of his love for the spirit is you let there be freedom let there be freedom shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. 
lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever Great is 
Thanks, David and Darcy. That was amazing. If you're just tuning in, welcome here. We're glad that you've joined us. We are about to hear a message from Brent Trickett, one of our board members. But before we do that, would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you that we can gather together digitally when we aren't able to gather physically. I just ask that you would speak through Brent, Lord, as we explore the myth that there will be no conflict when we start a relationship with you. I pray that you would be in all of our relationships, that you would bring peace where there's tension, God, that you would bring healing where there's pain. We pray this in your name. Amen. Welcome back to week two of our Not As Advertised series. I'm Brent. I'm one of the elders here, and I just want to thank you for joining us this morning. Now, can I start off by telling you something? That I've got a problem. Now, I like to think of myself as a pretty good person, but believe it or not, I sometimes have some pretty serious issues. Now, for the most part, I'm a pretty chill guy. Nothing really gets under my skin. But if you really do want to get under my skin, if you really want to make me angry, I'm going to tell you how to do it. So get your pens out. The best way is sit down next to me on a couch and just start eating something crunchy. Anything. Carrots, chips, peppers, crackers. It doesn't matter what it is. If you do that, internally, my body will go into a rage. Now, Celeste, my wife, she always thought I was crazy and unreasonable. She still does sometimes. But then last year, I actually found out that there's a condition, I would say that describes me, but it more vindicates me, and it's called misophonia. Misophonia is a disorder in which certain sounds trigger emotional or physiological responses and that some, Celeste, might perceive as unreasonable given the circumstance. And those who have misophonia might describe it as when a sound just drives you crazy. And their reactions can range from anger and annoyance to panic and the need to flee. Sometimes I just need to get out of the room. You know, it felt so good to have this diagnosis. And I know I'm using that term pretty loosely because it was really just a Google search. But I had a diagnosis. And I was glad to know I wasn't crazy. Other people felt this way. But you know what? It still freaked me out that... I had this potential for so much anger within me and it could, could come up in such a short period of time. And it really freaked me out because I often feel those things towards the people I love and that I'm closest to, relationally and physically, because they come and sit right next to me on the couch. So why am I giving away my secrets on how to make me angry? In this Not As Advertised series, we've been talking about some of the myths that we sometimes believe about Christianity and how they can give us this inaccurate picture of what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus. When we go into any relationship with an expectation that is not met, there's a good possibility that we're going to experience frustration and we might just want to just give up. So today we want to look at this myth. If you know Jesus, you'll never have conflict. Now, again, people may not say it exactly like that, but they may say something like, you know what? If you just knew Jesus, he'd fix your relationship with your son, your girlfriend, your spouse, fill in the blank. You know, Celeste and I, we work with Family Life Canada, bringing help and hope to marriages and families. And in this time of COVID, we've heard so many more families that are experiencing more conflict than ever, mainly because they're spending so much more time together. And it's just like this pressure cooker for relationships. If anything's kind of festering, it's going to come out. So last week, we looked at why we experience a breakdown in relationships. And we were taking a look at the book of Genesis. And in chapter 3, when the humans decided they didn't want to trust God to determine what is right and what is wrong, that ended up fracturing our relationship with God and with others. And the whole story of the Bible is how God is at work throughout history to mend that relationship between us and God and us and each other. That's the story of Jesus. He makes it possible for us to be in a right relationship with God. And he changes us from the inside out. And he's at work recreating that perfect world by recreating us as a people of God. Now, if you're new to faith or you're just checking out who Jesus is, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. 
It's not about doing all the right things. It's about letting him work in us and through us. And as he does that, he restores the world back to the perfection he created. So how do we know that it's not true? If Jesus is in our life, we won't have conflict. Probably the easiest way to know is that Jesus himself had conflict. When we read through the first four books of the New Testament, we get this great picture of who Jesus is. It's a biography. And I love the fact that even though Jesus is God, he hangs around with all of these people that society just shunned or rejected. They could nothing to do with them. Jesus loved them. And people loved to listen to Jesus' teaching. And they were amazed at his teaching. In the book of Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, it says this. It says, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This was the source of Jesus' conflict, the teachers of the law. We had all these religious leaders of the day. They saw Jesus as a threat because Jesus had this understanding about God and life that they didn't. And the people loved Jesus. Now, even though Jesus loved everyone, he had this significant conflict with these religious leaders. Many of the Jewish people in that time were likely frustrated with their faith. They probably felt like their faith was also not as advertised. They were told that if they just did all the right things and followed all of the right rules, they would be blessed and they would be accepted by God. You see, these religious leaders had built this elaborate system of laws that not even they could keep, and they judged the common people by their failure to keep those same laws. And those people who wanted to know God were enslaved by this massive list of things that they needed to do to try and please God. And a relationship with God is not based on how much good you can do, because there's no way you can do enough. I think it's like if me and my son wanted to go to Hawaii, so we drive to Vancouver and jump in the ocean and decide we're going to swim there. He's 16. He's athletic. He'd make it a lot further than me. But here's the reality. We're both going to die. And the same is true about trying to be good enough to be accepted by God. It doesn't matter how good you are. You can't be good enough. You can't be perfect. But this is exactly the burden that the religious leaders had put on people. Their job was to keep all of the rules. That was their job. But regular people saw no way to be as good as the religious leaders. And it's against that backdrop that Jesus gives us his greatest sermon recorded. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it starts in chapter 5. And in in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about the importance of the scriptures that these religious leaders were teaching and how we're supposed to be obeying all these things that are commanded. But he goes on and he drops his bombshell on them. In verse 20, he says this. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was telling them that they need to be better than the teachers of the law when they felt they couldn't even be as good as them. And he knows that's a losing proposition, but he was setting them up for some radical new teaching. And he starts here talking about anger and conflict. So let's take a look at what he says in starting in verse 21. He says this, you have heard it. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Now this is my kind of sermon. This is one where I get to sit back and relax and listen to the stories and jokes. Cause Hey, I've never killed anybody. This is going to be a walk in the park. And Jesus is talking about one of the 10 commandments from the old Testament here. Do not murder. And I'm sure most of the people sitting there listening to them were feeling like me. They were feeling pretty good at this point as well because, hey, I've never killed anybody. But then Jesus throws a curveball and listen to what he says next in verse 22. He says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. See, Jesus goes beyond the action of murder and he gets to the heart of the issue that we are an angry people and that is just as serious as murder. But again, I think, you know what? I'm a pretty good guy and I've never used the word raka before when I talk to anybody. And that word in Aramaic means empty and probably means empty head. And our equivalent today 
could be saying, you're an idiot. Uh Uh-oh, I just got a whole lot guilty. If I get to be honest about the amount of times I call people idiots in frustration, my guilt meter would be redlining right now. See, I get frustrated with other drivers. I really get frustrated with politicians, anyone who disagrees with me. And I got this whole other list of people that I get frustrated with. And Jesus is telling us here that anger runs deeper than we think. We all experience anger to differing degrees. It's part of our human condition, and it is also a result of that follow-up from that decision to stop trusting God in Genesis chapter 3. Now, I should say here that experiencing anger is not necessarily a sin. It's what we do with that anger that matters. There's a story about when Jesus entered this temple and people were coming from all over to worship. And the religious leaders, they were taking advantage of the people by selling them things that they needed. And Jesus got angry and he just cleared out the temple. That's a justified anger. And sometimes anger is an appropriate response to a situation. You know, not that long ago, when I saw the video of the murder of George Floyd, I felt anger burning up inside of me. And I wanted to jump inside that screen and I wanted to help and I wanted to make it stop. See, George was the person. He was made in the image of God, but he was being treated like an animal. I think I felt angry like most people did because we are also people made in the image of God. And that anger is a reflection of what God feels in his heart. But there are times though when anger is not an appropriate response. You know, when I was at the worst point in my life, I hated people. I just could not stand people. I was a bartender and the stereotype is true. People would sit there and they'd tell you their problems. And I was in such a bad spot that I just ended up hating people. I didn't want to hear anything about them. I had no empathy. And I had a hard time shaking that anger towards people, even after I became a Christian, because it was so ingrained in who I was and how I saw people. When I was in university, I was in this Bible study, and someone shared this verse with me. It's from the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. And it says this. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. We use that often. You hear people talk about that in marriage. Hey, you never let the sun go down while you're angry. Never go to bed angry is what people will say. But the first part, I realize that I can feel anger, but not be sinning, not be doing bad things. It's what I did with that anger that really made a difference. I always have a choice to either work to figure out a resolution. But what often happens is we might do things like gossip about the person we're angry at, so others know how just bad they are. We can become impatient. You can yell, scream, hit, or any other number of reactions that are wrong. But just because anger is part of our human condition, it doesn't need to define who we are or how we act. And Jesus goes on to say, and he says, you fool. Anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now this seems to be really harsh, when Jesus says this. But Jesus, I think, wants us to realize the next point, that anger is more serious than we think. Now, Jesus isn't saying here that if you ever swear at another driver or if you vent about a bad haircut that you got, you're going to spend eternity in hell. And we shouldn't feel guilty about some of those things. But we talked about this last year during our Love and War series. But when Jesus talks about hell like this, he doesn't talk about hell simply as a destination that we may end up someday, but it's also a reality that we are making right now. Jesus uses the word Gehenna for hell here, which is a valley just outside Jerusalem, that when he uses that imagery, people would recognize as a burning heap of garbage and dung, and it's a place of pure evil. That's how they looked at it. They would be reminded that in their history, people would sacrifice children to other gods there, And whenever Jesus teaches on hell, he reminds us that if we don't take care of our heart issues, we are creating these little pockets of hell and evil here on earth. And Jesus' plan for us, though, is to heal our hearts and to bring an ever-expanding circle of heaven or his kingdom here on earth. So what is it that Jesus is trying to teach us here? Is that God is more concerned with the state of our heart than he is with our outward behavior? This is what's radical about Jesus' teaching. 
You know, most religions teach that if we just do the right things, we have a chance of eternal peace. The story of Jesus is that we can never be good enough, but we can know God and we can be accepted by him because Jesus died and rose again and paid the price for all the bad things that we have done. But then he goes to work in us and changes us to be the people he created us to be. This is God's plan to change the world by changing us and using each one of us to bring about the world that God intended. So we've looked at the fact that anger is a part of our human condition. And anger unchecked brings destruction in our relationships, in our world. So what can we do to make sure conflict doesn't ruin our relationships? Well, Jesus goes on to give us two examples of what it looks like to live in right relationship with others. So look what he says in the next paragraph. He says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. See, Jesus is saying here that just coming to church and doing the right things, being a good person isn't enough. Just because we might feel that we're doing okay with God doesn't mean that things are okay. In fact, if there's conflict between us and other people, God wants us to go and make that right before we come to him and worship. And in the next example, someone is explicitly accused this person. And God says we should still make the effort to reconcile before things get out of hand. He says this, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So if we're ever experiencing conflict or a breakdown in relationships, here's what Jesus is asking us to do. The first point is be first. You know, in the Love and War series I did last year and in the Who's in Charge series that Pastor Paul just did a couple months ago, we both talked about the need for forgiveness to heal relationships. And we both used a passage from Matthew chapter 18. And in Matthew chapter 18, we're told that if someone has done something wrong to us, go to them and tell them that they've wronged us. And we tend to talk a lot about that chapter, I think, because because when there's conflict between us, it always feels better to go tell somebody that they're wrong and to hear them say, I'm sorry. But here Jesus is telling us that even though we might think we have done nothing wrong, if there's some breakdown in the relationship, it's still on us to go and make sure that we've heard the other person and see how we may have hurt them. You know, I'm 51 years old and this has been my hardest year ever for conflict. On a couple different occasions, important people in my life have thought or said things about me that just weren't true. And at first I get a little bit angry, but then I thought, you know what? I can't control how they feel. And I thought I would let it go because I knew I had done nothing wrong. Or I thought I had done nothing wrong. So I could just ride it out. I could avoid them. But what I realized is these long-term relationships were breaking down because of assumptions, misinformation, and a lack of communication. Now, I can't control anybody else's feelings, but I knew that not dealing with these relationships was affecting other relationships that were surrounding us. It was destroying these communities we were in, and it wasn't pleasing to God that these friendships were deteriorating. I had to do the hard work of calling both of them and asking them the simple question, have I done something to offend you? You know, in both of these cases, important conversations happened and a healing process was able to start. And it was only after those conversations that I realized that there were a bunch of misassumptions and a bunch of misinformation. And when we ask that question, in order to let the healing begin, we need to be humble. You know, anytime we ask a question, we may not get the answer that we want. We need to be willing to admit that, oh, maybe I've contributed to this situation. And whenever I'm experiencing conflict, I try to ask myself or others around me, have I done anything to contribute to this situation? And after you do that, it's so hard to be humble and not defensive. So we have to be first, we have to be humble, and then we have to be quick. 
See, conflict arises when we let anger and frustration pile up. Even though it's hard to work through conflict, the rewards are great. Les and Leslie Parrott, who are marriage authors, say that conflict is the price that healthy couples pay for intimacy. And the same is true for all of our relationships. We need to keep a clean slate in all of our relationships because we can only leave anger and frustration unchecked for so long before it piles up and it explodes. It's like letting fuel accumulate. And when you have a bunch of fuel, it only takes a small spark to come along and then look out. Those small things can lead to massive destruction. We experienced this on Mother's Day 2019. We had a great day celebrating Celeste. The kids all did stuff for her and it was really nice. And then we got the kids to bed and me and Celeste went to our room and we began to talk, just having a regular conversation. And that's when the explosion happened. Now, it wasn't a relational explosion. We're okay. It was a loud noise and then a bang in our laundry room. And I remember saying, what was that? And in the time, short time of that sentence, that question, our house started just filling with smoke. And at that point, there's really nothing you can do but just run around, <laughs> knock on doors, getting kids out, find the dog, get everybody out of the house. And so we're standing out on the street and it's a great way to meet your neighbors if your house is ever on fire because they all come and what's going on? The fire department's there, they're clearing the house. And you just wonder like, how could this happen? And it turns out it was something simple. It was the lint trap in our dryer that did us in. Now we're pretty responsible house owners and we maintain our appliances. We clean the lint trap every single time that we do a load of laundry. But what was happening that every time we would pull that lint trap out, there's always a little bit that would get down there. And somehow there's just a little tiny piece of lint getting down there every load. And so over a number of years, every time we push that lint trap back down, we were pushing that little bit of lint further down into the dryer. Now over 10 years, we had packed down so much lint that the air couldn't circulate and essentially it was fuel. And all it needed was a little spark to light it up. And just like our lint trap, if we don't take care of even the smallest conflict and we let conflict accumulate, eventually we're gonna pay the price. With enough fuel, even a small spark can create a huge mess. Now I know all of this is easier said than done, but know that you don't need to walk through this alone. This is what we're here for as a community to help each other. So if you're having trouble with frustration and anger, and if conflict is affecting your relationship, would you consider inviting a mentor into your life that they can journey with you or talking with one of the pastors here just to help figure that out and how to get started? What's my next step? You know, if you're in a, a marriage relationship or a committed relationship, we also have trained marriage mentor couples who would love to walk alongside you and guide you through 14 crucial conversations that will help you hone your communication skills. Now, when you're thinking about mentoring, please don't think that you need to be in crisis to take advantage of this. In fact, if you're in a good spot, that's the best time to start having these conversations, the best time to start looking at how to handle this. So then you'll have the skills uh, when your relationship is strong to work through some of these things when it's not going great. God loves you and he wants the best for your relationships. And he gives us each other for encouragement on the journey. We're all in this together. So would you let us know how we can journey with you? You can do that by emailing us at connections at cdac.ca. Or if you'd like someone to pray for you right now, you can just click that prayer button and somebody will join you. Will you make sure you join us in two weeks when we're gonna look at our third myth? If Jesus is in your life, you'll always feel close to him. We'll see you then. Thanks, Brent. And thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you miss any of the messages in this series or our past series, you can find them on our YouTube channel. And when you're there, make sure to subscribe for more content. If you have any questions during this series or about the Christian faith, we would love to help you with them. Just message us at connections at cdac.ca. We would love to help you with them. Thanks again for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your Sunday.